Lord, we ask that uh, you remind us in this space that we have set aside to sit in front of your word, of your character, that you are good, that your love endures forever, that those words that we just sang, Father, would you make them go deeper into our hearts and minds and show us places where we are not trusting you, where we are not believing that you love us and that you know what is good and right and best for us. And Father, would you especially help us as we grapple with the character of your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, whom you have delegated all authority and honor. And uh, we ask that you would, by your spirit, transform our thinking, transform our our hearts and and have that flow out of our lives so that we would live in such a way that would bring Jesus honor. And we pray all these things in his powerful name. Amen. So I was thinking about uh, kind of a theme of the last 70 years has been, let's do it my way. Just thinking about since uh, Frank Sinatra sang in my way, Burger King had a had a 40 year run of the slogan, have it your way. And they just changed it evidently in 2014 to be your way or something like that. I didn't really wrap my mind around it. Um, but I was thinking it's not that different. Um, maybe even more. Uh, there's a big trend I was reading this week about mass customization that offers consumers made to order footwear and apparel, and jewelry, pharmaceuticals, we can customize our world. We can customize our margins, our playback speed. Uh, We can add house rules to the games that we play. We have lots of choices in how we live our life. And there are certainly very um, good things about that. We are all unique. God has made us unique. And there's not one of us that is exactly the same as the other. But I think this trend, have it your way, let's live it my way, let's customize everything to be my way, that pushes on something that's a human tendency that is not perhaps the best thing, that um, we want to chart our own course and live our way. But we learn in our passage this week and throughout the Bible that God calls us to live his way. And there are parts of that that push on my heart and I'm guessing probably push on your heart too. That you may not, like I may not, be super excited about forgiving people the way God wants me to forgive them or spending your money or your time or your thoughts, having your priorities to be in accordance to his way, that our lives would bear fruit, that it would show the world that we don't belong to ourselves, that we belong to him, that he is our Lord, he, that Jesus is our king um, and not us, and that we would live by his grace, supremely under Jesus' authority. And in doing that, not just doing that outwardly, but we could sing from our heart, oh, give thanks to the Lord for his love, for his love endures forever. We were wandering and lost. We were doing our own thing. But then God showed us his way. In his mercy and kindness, he brought us to himself. We were far out on the ocean, making wealth and chasing dreams. But the waves of great destruction brought us trembling to our knees. And we cried like drunken sailors to the only one who hears. And the God of comfort heard us. And he took away our tears. So um, that's, I think, what we can learn tonight. Or hopefully, by God, by his grace, will help us to learn um, in large ways and incremental ways of what it looks like to belong to Jesus, what it looks like to live his way and to trust that God uh, in Christ knows us and loves us better than we know ourselves. And so I just anticipate and ask you to pre-anticipate with me that um, this will passage will push you and push me in ways that expose some of the places in our hearts where we don't 
like God's authority. And we don't want to surrender or submit to him. So with that, let's uh, jump into our lesson, uh, open up our Bibles to if, uh, turn them on. We're going to be in uh, Matthew 21, picking up in uh, verse 18, and then going through uh, a portion of chapter 22. So we're covering about a chapter, but sort of in the middle of two chapters. And so last week, you may remember that we, and of course you do because you were just in discussion group, uh, we entered the last week of Jesus' life, and Matthew is slowing down the narrative. So we're going to spend uh, chapters uh, 21 to 28 with this last week of Jesus, I'm sorry, it's not the last week of Jesus' life. It's the last week of his earthly life before um, before the cross and b- before he ascends to heaven and uh, is uh, continuing his eternal life that he has always lived. So um, we, he, we saw his triumphal entry into Jerusalem, or you could think about it, his semi-triumphal entry, because even though he entered triumphantly to cries of Hosanna and praise, praise there were always staunch opposition. And I suggest to you all the events of this week, they, as the narrative place slows down and there's rising conflict and we always feel the opposition to Jesus, his character and his person and his work, that um, there will come a day when all knees will bow before the Lord Jesus and he will be in triumph. So that's anyway, semi-triumphal, but it's foreshadowing that time in the future where it's, uh, where it's perfect. Um, and so he, he drew the resistance and he went straight to the temple. He disrupted false practices like, but greater than King Hezekiah, King Josiah, and he healed and he received praise and worship as Davis promised kingly heir, um, like, but greater than King Solomon, um, from children. And, uh, so this again was a symbolic foretaste of, of a still future reality, um, for us and the presence of fierce resistance. We're going to see that theme carry on. So tonight we're going to look at this, this chapter in two sections. They are a little bit imbalanced in length. Um, I wrestled with it, but the, here's, here's, here's what we're going to do. Uh, two, we're going to look at it physically, physical scenes. So we have one scene in the um, verses 21, 18 to 21, 22. This is Jesus on the way back into Jerusalem, and we'll see him, uh, his authority to evaluate and delegate as he interacts with a fig tree and his disciples. And then we're going to see our second division again, which is a longer division, but it will be when Jesus is physically in the temple courts and he's engaging with the religious leaders. So that will be 21, 23 through 22, 14. And so that will be Jesus's authority to, oh, I'm not really sure that, let's say teach, teach and lead. So Jesus' authority to evaluate and delegate will be the first uh, division we'll go into right now. And then we'll follow that up with Jesus' authority to teach and lead. Though we might tweak that. We'll see you as we get there. Maybe you can maybe you can help me. What you think the bit, the big idea is for that second division? Okay, so um, we're gonna our first our first division verses eighteen to twenty two. This mysterious little verse or little section of Jesus ju- judging a fig tree and um, and answering his disciples' questions. So there's two distinct thoughts. Um, in the first two verses when he is um, interacting with the fig tree and then in the, th- the third or the second three verses uh, 20 to 22 when he's interacting with his disciples they are connected but um, I also suggest to you have in your mind go back to Matthew 3 this is John the Baptist and what he talks about he introduces the ideas of trees and fruit. Um, and uh, so let's just think of it, have that in our heads that this is John the Baptist. He came to pre- prepare the way for the Lord. Verse two, and his message was repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. 
and um, he talked about trees. And uh, when there were, he called people to repent and people came to him and verse six, confessed their sins. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. Um, and he was making straight paths for the Lord uh, as the prophet Isaiah had, had foretold in verse three. And then he talks about uh, producing fruit in keeping with repentance. And he's speaking that to the religious leaders who didn't come out with repentant hearts, evidently, that he knew. And so uh, verse 8, produce fruit in keeping with repentance and talked about a judgment. Uh, the Acts verse 10 is already at the root of the trees and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. So have that ring in your ears because here we go. Um, Jesus is the setting where he had come into Jerusalem, but even though Matthew doesn't talk to us about it, um, this was one of the annual festivals that Jewish people were required to attend to. So Jerusalem, the population had swollen and we don't know why did he stay in Bethany or Bethphage uh, about two miles outside Jerusalem. It's possible because there wasn't any room in the inn in, Jer- in Jerusalem, but he might have stayed with Mary and Martha and Lazarus. Um, it was about two miles away on the eastern slope of the Mount of Olives. And so um, Jerusalem was full of those Passover worshipers, and we will see Jesus make this daily commute during this Passover week. And so Matthew tells us this very uh, uh, cryptically, the scene, we'll read verse 18 and 19, early in the morning as he was on his way back to the city, he was hungry, Jesus. Seeing a fig tree by the road, he went up to it, but found nothing on it except leaves. Then he said to it, may you never bear fruit again or more literally in the Greek, into the age, into eternity. Um, And immediately the tree withered. So um, without context, if we just take this isolation, Jesus seems perhaps petulant or hangry. He's interacting with this poor frig, poor fig tree. And you might wonder, is this how Jesus is in the morning when he doesn't have coffee? Um, What's going on? But this passage shows the importance of reading the Bible in context. If we think about what came before, we think about what came after. There was a tension of uh, particularly the religious leaders of not living, not acting, not being the kind of servants that God had anticipated them, uh, had called them to be. And uh, I don't know, I did grow up on a farm, but we did not have any fig trees. We had cows and hay and some corn. Um, But evidently, so what I've read is that fig trees in Palestine, the, the season is summer. So that starts in June. And so this would have been like late March, early April. And evidently a fig tree that proportionately the figs and the leaves grow almost at the same rate. And so if you see leaves, baby leaves on a fig tree, you should also see baby figs that would be green and and hard, but still edible. And as the leaves get bigger, so do the figs and and bigger and bigger. So um, you you can Google those pictures of like Google fig buds. And it's actually very weird. Like you would never, I would think an, you know, an apple tree is pretty fully leafed by the time there are little apple buds and, but figs don't work that way evidently. And so this fig tree evidently did have leaves. Maybe they were young leaves, but anyway, there should have been still edible if green fruit on them and there wasn't any on this tree. It was all show and no fruit, false advertising. And so I suggest to you that Jesus is here acting out a parable that was common in the Old Testament uh, by prophets like Ezekiel and Jeremiah, Hosea. This is an object lesson. And a fig tree by its very nature should bear figs. That's what fig trees do. And in the Old Testament, figs or fig trees uh, are often used, well, sometimes used as a symbol for Israel. 
And you can uh, use a concordance to find a lot of those verses like Jeremiah 8, 13, Hosea 9, 10, and 16. Um, And so if a fig tree by its very nature should bear figs, even in the early season, God's people by their very nature should reflect belonging to God. Even at that early season of revelation from the Lord, they had received enough revelation to know his heart, to know how to live in a way that was reflective of him as king. And um, that evidently was not what Jesus found when he came and entered Jerusalem as king. And so uh, Jesus had demonstrated this throughout his ministry. He's going out. He's looking at the crowds with compassion. They are sheep without a shepherd. They're hungry. They're hurting. And where are the religious leaders? In Matthew, the religious leaders almost exclusively show up not to care for the people of God, but as self-appointed fence makers and policemen to to test Jesus and try to trap him. And we're going to see that in this next section. And that is not the kind of fruit that their lives should have displayed. Going back to just even what John said to us, uh, to them uh, as a group, that they should bear fruit in keeping with repentance. And if they didn't, their God would have accountability that he would bring to them. Um, And so uh, fruit in keeping with repentance also includes hearts that are willing to hear God's call to let go of our own ways, let go of our own desires and live according to his kingdom priorities. And then sadly, what we have found in the book of Matthew and also probably uh, I have seen it in my life and maybe you have in yours that some of the people who should be the most fruitful because they're the, they're the most proximally related to God's word, to his people, to power in, in God's church, that they are maybe not the people who are the most fruitful. Every life does bear some kind of fruit, whether it's good or bad. And so after finding no fruit on this fig tree, Jesus pronounced something, and by his word, the power of his word made its fruitlessness permanent, exposed it, and it made it that expression with the, uh, the into the age to the literal Greek, which suggests that he's talking more than just about a tree, that, he's, that this is a, a parable that he's acting out. And so understood this way, Jesus' actions symbolically warn of a coming time of accountability where all pretense and hypocrisy will be exposed. And we who profess to follow Jesus should take this as both encouragement and warning. Um, what kind of fruit does Jesus expect from you, from me, in this season of our lives? And what kind of leaves or appearances of godliness do we have? And are they matched by real tangible evidence of actual fruit of godliness, of trusting Jesus and walking with him? Um, so in verses 20 to 22, the disciples do not seem to recognize the symbolism, which maybe if they had asked, what does this mean? We'd seen them ask that before in the parables, say in chapter 13, but they're more amazed, it seems here, by the power, the quickness of it. And so they ask in verse 20, when the disciples saw this, they were amazed. How did the fig tree wither so quickly, they asked. And um, so they had seen Jesus restore life, uh, a shriveled hand, for example, in uh, chapter 12, 13, but perhaps they had not seen the opposite. Uh, And so this suggests that they had a growing understanding of their calling, and Jesus' answer echoes his earlier teaching to them in chapter 17, 20, when they could not cast out a demon from a man's son. And so he says um, here, very similar to what he said there, by the way, this you is plural in Greek. So as, as in chapter 17, here also, hear this as a you plural. I tell you, plural, the truth, if you have faith and do not doubt, not only can you 
do what was done to the fig tree, but also you can say to this mountain, go, throw yourself into the sea and it will be done. If you believe, you will ask whatever you receive in prayer. Both cases suggest Jesus' disciples as doing things not independent of Jesus, as if Jesus was a genie, but with, as Jesus' authorized delegates. And so this, in contrast with the religious leaders who would be on this mountain, this mountain here in this case suggests the Temple Mount, that they could have been walking down the valley and then coming up, as he was saying, this mountain... That certainly would have probably been the one in view. Um, Also, uh, in contrast, those religious leaders were also God's authorized delegates, but they would lose out because of their unbelief, because they refused to believe God's prophet, capital P, Jesus. And so, um, and this hints of, as the next section is going to elaborate for us, a new leadership. And so these disciples... uh, most of whom would be apostles, were called to a bold cooperative faith that it receives Jesus' kingship and trust that he calls them to do Jesus' kind of things in Jesus' ways. And in here, what's being exampled, it seems, is judgment, evaluation. And if you look at uh, chapter 13, verses 28, there's a reference to that. So, But there is also an implicit test in this invitation um, by extending his disciples' responsibility and agency, saying, whatever you will be asked for, that's going to translate into fruit. Um, What the kind of requests that you make, the quality in which they align with the character of the God whom you're asking them for and Jesus in whose name you're approaching him, you, these will be evaluated. Are those fitting for a delegate of Jesus? So a principle I think that we can learn from this section is that we are accountable for our lives' fruit. We are accountable for our lives' fruit. And there's two parts in that. The first part is that our lives will bear fruit. That is inevitable. What is inside you will come out, your loves, your loyalties, belief. And now this time in St. Louis is a time when things start to grow and bud. And so if you're planting a seed or if you see something come up, a plant, you have expectations for it. What is it going to be? Growing things yields fruit. That's how God made the world, right? In Genesis 1, he had seed bearing fruit, bear seeds. Um, And so what is fruit? Fruit speaking in this metaphorical way for us as people is since we're not plants, it is a composite picture of our behavior, our attitudes and our words. And so if you think about what's your fruit, think about if your life is a tree, what's growing on that tree? What kind of tree are you? And it includes the big things that you should consider. Uh, What choices did you make in your family? when your family member had a health crisis? What, uh, what did you do when your boss asked you to do something that you knew was not ethical? Um, so it's big things, but it's also the fruit of my life and yours is also includes a lot of little things. The conversations that we have with coworkers, um, how we treat the people in line with us at the grocery store, the way we live when no one is working, the kind of prayers that we offer, um, the way that we're involved in our churches, the, that is also our fruit. There is no part of your life and mine that doesn't bear some kind of fruit. So the, that's the first part. Our lives will bear fruit. And then the second part, because a true faith in Jesus results in a life of good fruitfulness, that's what God will examine our lives for. And he's not doing that to make us believers, but when we bear fruit as believers in Jesus, it's evidence of the new life that he has graciously given to us when we believe. Um, I had a garden of tomato plants last year. I am a horrible gardener, by the way. For someone who grew up on a farm, it is very embarrassing. Um, And I think my maybe 10 tomato plants 
cumulative got about 10 to 15 tomatoes. So that is super embarrassing and disappointing. But I will say they did prove what kind of plants they were, that it wasn't a fig plant. It wasn't, you know, I don't know, a bramble plant. They were uh, disappointing, but they were tomato plants for sure. Um, And God has the, just as I as a very inadequate gardener have a right to expect that my tomato plants are going to grow. How much more does God have the right to ask his and to expect and demand fruit from each person he's created? We cannot bear the kind of fruit God is looking for in your life and mine without faith in Jesus without receiving Jesus as God's promised savior. And so that's, it's going to come into this next section is a theme and the, uh, the, the crux of, uh, whether people are in and out of this, uh, this separation that, that Jesus is going to talk about, um, in these next parables and the fruit, though faith in Jesus is invisible, it will be displayed in your life. Because faith in Jesus is repentance. It means we are repenting of our, our other ways, the ways that we're living according to our own idea about how life ought to be. Um, we are not living as God's enemy, but as his subjects by his grace. True believers will produce a fruit of repentance. That means we're learning to love God and we're learning to live like it in Christ. Um, So I wonder, what do your prayers say about that? What do the people who live closest to you, what would they say about your life's fruit? Um, They hopefully see the real you. And what does that look like? Do they see not perfect because they won't see perfect? Do they see repentant? Someone who is growing in repentance. Um, Jesus is Lord over all of life and our fruitfulness depends on our response to this. God calls us to live his way and living submitted gladly to Jesus as Lord of our lives will yield a life of fruitfulness that God intends. Okay, our second division that we're gonna, we're gonna go into and we're not gonna get bogged down in or keep high picture. Again, this is a longer division uh, starting in verse 23 of chapter 21. Um, but there are four parts working together to answer the questions posed in chapter 21, 23. Um, And if you're, so if you get lost in this, in this section or in these parables, come back to these questions. By what authority are you, Jesus, doing these things they ask and who gave you this authority? That's the crux of, if you're an underliner in your Bible, I would consider underlining those. That's a, that's a focal point. And I suggest to you that this section goes to answer those questions, um, the, the question puzzle that Jesus sets up and then the three parables. And so um, we're gonna see Jesus respond to the leader's question about his authority and we're gonna see him establish that authority and prove it. So uh, verse 23, uh, in addition to posing those questions, it also establishes a setting, the characters and, the, and by the questions, the conflict. So the place is the temple in Jerusalem. Um, he entered the temple courts And while he was teaching, the chief priests and the elders of the people this time, so that's a slightly different group that is coming up than they saw last time, who were the day before, who was, uh, I think, the chief priests and the scribes, um, or the teachers of the law. Yep, verse uh, 15. So a little bit different of a group, but still, um, they also are aligned with the Pharisees. They're hanging about, look at that in verse 45. Um, so we're, we've got all different kinds of uh, those religious leaders in that physical space. And in the temple, that was the physical space that God had authorized for the heart of the covenant relationship that he had established for Israel, for their worship, um, for their prayer, uh, for uh, their symbolizing their being with him and living life in covenant faithfulness with God. And so um, when they asked him, um, they came up to him 
by what authority are you doing these things, they ask. So what are these things? In context, it's probably all of it. Uh, he is teaching most immediately, but they probably haven't forgotten since some of them are certainly the same people that he was yesterday um, cleansing the temple, um, overturning the money changer tables and the, um, the, those selling sacrifices, but also he was healing. Look at that, verse 14. He was healing blind people and lame who came up to him in the temple. He was also receiving worship. Um, and that left the, that was the conflict they were indignant about in verse, uh, what is that, 15 or 16? I can't see, 15. Um, so it's probably all of that. What authority does he have to do these things? And as the spiritual shepherds of Israel, whom, who these people were, this was an appropriate question. They should be asking this question. But as it is revealed, it's not an honest question. Um, it's rather a veiled way of saying, we're in charge and we do not authorize you or these things that you're doing at all. Um, and yet... Jesus' healing and teaching here as throughout his ministry demonstrate he is neither just a mere man, if a pious one, nor is he an insane egoist. So who is he? And that is the question that I suggest Matthew was inviting us as his readers to grapple with. Who is Jesus and what is his authority? Um, and again, when we get confused, what's going on? Let's go back to these question, that question in verse 23, the double question, and ask how that section that we're confused about might answer those questions. Um, okay, so the first part of four, we're going to look at this first part, and then we'll look at all the parables together in one chunk and kind of an overview. And so the first part, Jesus gives a counter question about John the Baptist. It stalemates the leaders and it exposes their unbelief. And so um, we see in his response, 24, Jesus replied, I will also ask you one question. If you answer me, I will tell you by what authority I am doing these things. John's baptism, where did it come from? Was it from heaven or from men? And so the leaders then um, take it... (laughs) Take, it seems like a side conversation. They discussed it amongst themselves and they said, if we say from heaven, he will ask, then why didn't you believe him? But if we say from men, we are afraid of the people for they all hold that John was a prophet. And remember that we've looked back at Matthew 3. Matthew, his narrative has presented to us already the answer of this question. He told us in chapter three, I think was it verse two, that John the Baptist was a prophet. He did come to fulfill and he, uh, the prophecy in Isaiah. And so therefore he was, um, it was from heaven that he came. God had sent him to prepare the way for his greater son, prophet, capital P. And so um, notice that the leaders, however, are not interested at all in considering that question. And they're not interested, and they're, let's say, they're interested in avoiding further questions. They are, you know, they don't want Jesus to ask them, then why didn't you believe him? Why not? I don't know. They don't tell us. They probably, they're dishonest, right? They're not really interested in answering questions. But in saying we don't know, um, which is how they answered per verse 27, that uh, there are lots of other implications that for whatever reason they didn't consider or Matthew doesn't report that for us. They're exposing, as some of our leaders mentioned at our leaders meeting, their lack of authority their dishonesty, their failure as spiritual leaders, they were supposed to know. They were supposed to know and able to lead the people in discernment and they exposed the greatest loyalty. Their greatest loyalty was to power and to protecting that power, not serving God. And it doesn't seem that they believed that God was real, that he would actually speak or act or defend his servants. But refusing Jesus doesn't change his authority. It reveals what's in your heart. Jesus is and will be King of kings and Lord of lords, whether you like it or not, whether I like it or not, regardless of the people 
It's not a democratic vote. He is king of kings and lord of lords. And it's important to see this in context with the next sections because uh, Jesus' stalemate, as he said, (laughs) then neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. Ironically, he goes on to give them three parables. And parables we've seen in chapter 13 are stories that simultaneously reveal truth and can conceal it. But here, he, each parable has engaging questions for them. And Jesus offers an interpretation after each parable. And they get it. Look at verse 45. They knew he was talking about them. This is part of, he's not just this, he's not just hiding. He is appealing to them. He's pleading with them, offering them real warning and inviting them to turn, to look at their lives and their hearts and to acknowledge God for who he is and to understand Jesus as a Messiah and reorder their lives. And so Jesus' stalemate here was not just, oh, he's just so shrewd, which he is. Jesus, you will never trap Jesus. But he was not getting even with them. He wanted to teach them. I suggest to you, doesn't seem like they responded in the right way, but uh, Luke tells us in Acts 6, 7, that many priests, a great number of priests became obedient to the faith. And so I'm excited to learn someday where some of these, were they able to uh, turn and um, have faith in Jesus and receive eternal life. So we're going to take a big picture view here. There's, I suggest you five points from how Jesus' parables address the questions that are posed in verses about his authority in 21, 23. And as we are, we're invited to listen in. We have the same opportunities. Um, True repentance and belief have an ongoing aspect. So if you are a believer in Christ, know that that you're not just like, all right, I'm good. I'm in. But you and I are called to grow in our repentance, to grow in our understanding of uh, God's authority in Christ and our response to him. Okay, I think broadly as we look at these, we have a parable of the two sons, we have a parable of the the vineyard tenants or the vine dressers, and we have the parable of the wedding banquet. And um, broadly looking high level, five points. One, the leader's core problem is with God's real and personal authority. In their minds, they seem like they're governing a political landscape that doesn't have God in it at all. It stops at the ceiling. Um, But Jesus in these parables, it's not an accident. I suggest that Jesus gives three different metaphors for them to understand who God is and to remember their relationship, covenant commitment to him. God is like a father of sons. He's like a landowner with tenant workers. He's like a king with a special son whose wedding he wants to celebrate. And this universe has God at God at the center, not tucked to the side. And so even if God is not visible like a vineyard owner or a king, he's just as real and he's personal and he's authoritative. And Jesus invites these leaders to remember God's real and personal authority because he will call them to account. And each of these parables um, suggest that certainly the latter two, and it's uh, I think implied in the second one, or I'm sorry, in the first one. So that's the first one. The leader's core problem is with God's real and personal authority, and the parables call the listeners to see God as the center. The second, what is this real? What this real personal authoritative God requires is reasonable. What God asks of us is reasonable. In the first century, farmers had the, I'm sorry, fathers had the right to say to their sons, go work in the family business. Vineyard owners had the right to expect a payment of crop. Kings had the right to say, citizens, you will come and attend an event that I'm putting on. And moreover, the authoritative fathers in the last two parables, the vineyard owners 
uh, father as father and the king as father, they could reasonably expect that other people should respect their sons and extend to them the honor that they were due. That is reasonable. And reasonable demands cannot be satisfied by mere lip service. And that's the first, the point of the first parable is that it's not just okay to say nice reason, things, oh, oh yes, I will do what you want, <laughs> and then not actually do it. Like, it, you have to uh, respond to the reasonable demands. As creator of the world, God has the right to make demands. And we might think, and this is part of us, our wiring, I suggest to you the broken part of us that thinks that it's better, better and good and right for us to live our own way, that we think, or we can think, that it's not reasonable for God to demand sexual purity. It's not reasonable for him to think, to call me to live a life of a living sacrifice. It's not reasonable for God to expect the things that he does to live the way many, many other people aren't and to give my life totally over to him and not have anything left for myself. We might think in our head, that's not reasonable. But Jesus, the framing of these parables, I suggest to you, Jesus disagrees. What God asks of us is reasonable because he is, he's our authoritative God who is at the center of the universe. And the third point is, God's reasonable demands also imply blessing. He's not just an autocrat out for his own glory that doesn't care about us. Working in the father's or the master's well-constructed vineyard implicitly suggests benefits to one's own welfare. Those sons could expect they're actually working toward their own inheritance, sorry. And like, can you imagine a better, if you were looking for a vineyard to rent out and that you could work in, could you imagine a better one? Look at it. He put a wall around it. He did a Y press in it. Built a watchtower. This is the latest technology. This is a really good deal. We, there's blessing in that. It's going to be beneficial to work in that. And attending a king's lavish celebratory banquet it's the cast in verses uh, 22, 2, and 4. This should not be a burden. To come and have a free meal and like with friends that are enjoying uh, the king and his son. So God's, God's real and personal authority, what God demands is, is reasonable. In fact, what God, his reasonable ba- demands imply blessing when we cooperate. Therefore, Fourth, refusing to cooperate is unreasonable. Um, It violates relationship. It invites judgment and it refuses blessing. Moreover, it is a fight that you and I cannot win. How ludicrous for tenants to withhold the crop from the vineyard owner. How much more deluded to think that by killing the vineyard owner's servants and actually his son, that somehow you'll get away from it, you'll away with it, and you'll get the, the, the inheritance yourself. That's crazy. That's insane. And how insane to re- refuse a king's free and lavish banquet? I mean, that's not a good idea. But how much more insane to try to come to that banquet dressed in your own terms? The way that you want to be. Oh, I can be here just however I want to be. That's not how it works, friends. Um, It is unreasonable and ludicrous for us to refuse God's reasonable demands in his terms. And um, fifth thing, God is gracious. He shows great patience and does not delight in judgment. And we can see that uh, the first parable son who worked in the vineyard, um, even after he said he wouldn't, isn't punished. He's celebrated. And Jesus suggests that the tax collectors and the prostitutes who heard John the Baptist call to repentance uh, and they turn from sin, they receive fullness of joy to enter the kingdom of God. In chapter uh, 21, it's where Jesus interprets that first parable. What verse are those? 31 to uh, 32. Um, in contrast, there's no consolation prize for religious leaders who know God's law but refuse to accept God's gracious invitations to repent. 
And um, just as the Old Testament attests, God sent prophet after prophet to call his people back to covenant faithfulness. God is gracious and patient. But part two of this, God is gracious, but he will execute justice. He will not fail. His patience will run out um, if with his reasonable demands are extensively and persistently refused. In the first century, readers would recognize the right of retribution on those violating reasonable, gracious authority. If you're going to kill a vineyard master's son, you have to expect that you are not going to get away with it. It's reasonable for uh, the, even the religious leaders say it in their own terms. Jesus says, therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? He will bring those wretches to a wretched end, they replied, and he will rent the vineyard to other tenants who will give him his share of the crop at harvest time. And similarly, um, at the, the, the end, uh, they, the king who would take his army and uh, destroy the city, that, that is a gracious king, but at the end of his patience, and we see it most personally in verse 13, where the king told the attendants uh, about the man who was not dressed in wedding clothes to be tied hand and foot, verse 13, and be thrown outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So his justice, if God is like these, and Jesus is suggesting as a reliable speaker for God, God's patience will run out and his justice will be terrible. Not bad, terrible. Good, terrible. But that is hard for us to take in. God does have wrath. And that is uncomfortable for us. And I I invite you to sit in that tension and wrestle with God. Allow the opportunity, allow him the opportunity to shape your thinking um, God's wrath is not getting even like our human sense of retribution or vengeance might be, but it is a just and measured response to attacks on his holiness. And some people will say, I don't, I cannot believe in a God who would send people to hell, who would have wrath like that. They may say, maybe this is you. Maybe this, like, certainly you and I know people who would ask and say these things uh, to say, I want a God, but not his wrath. But the Bible presents God's character as a whole. We don't get to pick and choose who he is. Um, His attributes and actions are all interwoven and perfect always. And our problem, one of our problems is that we have too low a view of sin. And we gasp when sin is severe, but to a, a holy and righteous God, even very small sins in our eyes are an utter outrage to his holiness and righteousness. Humans are morally responsible to our creator God for our actions and our hearts. We all deserve the eternal wrath of God as his just response to our sin. And therefore, God's wrath is the greatest problem that humans face. But what God, what is God calling us to do with this sobering truth? We cannot just study a passage like this and walk away from a lesson just sad and shaken. I suggest to you that God is calling each of us to listen, to yield, and to bow to him in specific ways, in ways that matter. And today, like in that day of judgment, or like in the day here, not the day of judgment, but like the day that Jesus was engaging with the religious leaders, Jesus is offering a real expression of eternal truth, and he's calling us to come to him humbly and to trust him for great things and experience the fruit of active faith and dependent prayer in our lives. And as we recognize Jesus' truth and authority in intensely personal ways, We will live our daily lives and prepare for the great wedding feast of eternity. So what do we do with a passage like this? God is calling us to love Jesus intensely, 
to submit to his authority in matters, matters big and small and to recognize the peril faced by those who live their lives with little thought of God or eternity and do not return to Jesus for rescue. Our wedding clothes are not just fine garments reserved for an eternal celebration. They are gracious gifts from God when Jesus died on the cross for our sins and he took on our sinful garments and we received his robes of righteousness. God has clothed us now with a message for his power and eternal impact. Praise the Lord. Praise Jesus Christ. And with that, let's pray. Lord, thank you for this space that we've had to think about uh, who you are, Lord Jesus, and to understand the answer to those questions that your heavenly Father, God, has authorized you to be his son, to be his full delegate and given full authority. Lord, would you help us to wrestle with that truth in the places where we are out of step? Uh, And I pray, Father, for your mercy uh, for any who have not received um, and trusted you, Jesus, for their eternal salvation, that they would look to you and trust in you, and cross over by your grace from death into life. So Father, would you um, take us from this place and uh, help us um, in Christ to live lives that bear fruit for him this week. We pray in his name. Amen.